So we titled this project Insight Out of Chaos Community Data Analysis Tool Workshop. And it's a pun that we're surprised no one else has made before that we're aware of. Um, the objective of our work is to find insight using the data analysis uh, brain share that chaos has, so applying metrics and knowledge models to open source communities, but also to find new insights from the overwhelming amount of data and information streams that open source communities generate. Um, and the way we're going to do that today is gonna, we're going to show you the tools that we use to make that happen. Here's a little reminder of the technical requirements for the follow along component of this talk. Um, we're going to need Docker and Docker Compose because we're going to be bringing up a multi-container application. And then obviously Git, which hopefully everybody has on their laptop, to clone the repository where we have all the source. And then for the second part of the talk, we're going to need some relatively modern version of Python so that we can hopefully avoid any package discrepancies, but I don't know how optimistic I am on that particular thing, so if we have any issues with that, we can settle on a virtual environment version that makes sense. And then we'll need Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks will let us go through an analysis project together, step by step, so that you can take that with you when you leave, um, and maybe play with it and get involved with the community that way. Who are we to be giving this talk in the first place. Um, it was on the initial slide, so I'm going to go back to it with our names, but I'm James Kunstel. I'm a software engineer in Red Hat's open source program office. And then I'm Kelly Dolphy. I'm a senior data scientist in um, Red Hat's OSPO. And yeah, we're both um, a part of the community outreach team within our OSPO, and specifically, we are the two of two for the data team within that. And so about two years ago, two and a half years ago, under a different name, we started, Callie started um, OSS Aspen, which at the time was called Project San Diego, which has been the name that it has been in different conference talks. And from there, we have a couple of different repositories named 8Knot and Repel, where we do all of our work. It's all open data app development and open data analysis. So our team's day job, our responsibility is to assist and support a variety of personas in the open source software space, particularly in Red Hat. Community architects are kind of our bread and butter. They're the individuals that we work with day to day and who we learn from. Um, business leadership frequently have questions for us. Technical contributors to projects have questions about how their decision making will impact communities. Um, and finally, community members. We talk to community members pretty frequently to help them figure out what the right move might be for their community at a higher level. And we help them by providing data science resources to understand and to make good decisions about communities in the context of their role. So someone who's in business leadership has a totally different perspective on community than someone who is strictly a community architect versus a community member. So we help figure out what the right strategy is uh, for a community in their particular role. And in this talk, we want to share our process for doing this and the resources that we have so that more people can get involved in this space. Our fundamental objective is to support community sustainability by preparing and upskilling community members to make more data-supported decisions. So bring data rather than uh, gut or really not replace gut, because gut is really, really important when it comes to community data, but bring data into the mix so that people can see a higher level perspective on community. We're gonna pause for just a second and get a survey of the room. Like, why was this workshop appealing to you? And all honest answers are accepted. It might be that you didn't like PG workshop or the Kubernetes workshop. We're just kind of interested in like what the level set is, who you guys are, and what would you ideally like to get out of a workshop like this? And then we'll share our objectives and we'll try to meet in the middle so that we tell you what we think is important from our exper experience and also maybe put more pointed emphasis on stuff that you're interested in. So anybody who'd like to volunteer their perspective, we'd love to just raise your hand and we can talk about it. Yeah. Computer science student. I'm just interested in data science. Cool. Awesome. And from, for the recording. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, for we designed 8 Knot very specifically that the barrier of entry, especially for like people coming out of school or specifically data sciences to be really low. We'll go into this a little bit later, later but it's very um, modular and there's only, like, you can, okay, I wanna work on a visualization. Here's the files that you need to touch. Here's the process that we'll need to be able to do. And actually 8 Knot is used in some like entry level software engineering classes for people to like get their first taste in how does the process committing to GitHub work? How does contributing upstream work? And so I'll be curious to hear your feedback at the end of this of how um, accessible it really is. Anybody else? Thank you so much. <laughs> You're what? Cool. Okay, phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic, and I think that we'll be able to really help with that, because a lot of what we do is like multiple levels. Like, okay, do you just need data that you really can work with and trust? Do you want to go that next step further and have uh, pre-developed visualizations that you can consume and just use? And then the next step, which Callie will cover, is how do you then extend that portfolio that we've developed that we think kind of covers the table stakes of what most people need, um, or at least most of our uh, stakeholders have needed so far? And then how can we extend that that next step? So that'll be the later portion of this talk. So we hope that's really helpful for you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? No, uh, no sweat. Cool. Thank you so much for those who, who did share. Um, here's what we wrote down initially that we really wanted attendees to get out of this talk. We wanted to level set a little bit in the first place and understand the motivations and novelties of the tools we develop. The two tools that we're going to be talking about specifically are Augur and 8-Knot, just to use the proper nouns. Um, then we wanted to give you a, a working knowledge of how to get 8-Knot running for yourself, which should be super easy. We've de designed it so that if you have Docker Compose and the right credentials, it's just immediately possible. Um, we do make the assumption, however, that you have a publicly available Augur instance, which we provide in our project documentation, and we'll share the credentials with you to access one that'll be available for this demonstration. Um, but in the future, usually, uh, for, for any specific team, it's nice to run your own. And we're working with the upstream or uh, community maintainers on that to make that even easier to get running. Then we're gonna go through and provide a framework to design a visualization or a brand new metric that addresses a question that you might have about the open source software or about some OSS community. We've already developed that visualization walkthrough so that it's fine tuned and it's ready for, and consumable, but hopefully you can apply it to another idea that you might have that you see in what we've developed and you're thinking, oh, I really want to see this thing. How can I go make that happen? Um, we'll go through our framework of how we choose specific metrics, and specifically will intersect with the Chaos Project, um, which is, I actually have never said it out loud, um, it's a community health metrics project. Um, I don't know the full definition, though. Like, I don't want to short circuit the whole definition of Chaos. That's what I thought. Community health analytics for open source software. It's one of the most fantastic resources for getting started in this space because it gives you like the first 99% of thinking about how you can approach a community health problem or try to understand something in a ton of depth. And it's a bunch of documentation by really, really, really smart people. This workshop, um, the things that are under the chaos branch, the Augur project, which we'll go into, and then um, specifically looking at their documentation around metrics and metrics models, and how that goes into choosing what visualizations you look at, and then how to develop your own visualizations. Um, from my personal experience with like a lot of these visualizations, I'm like the data scientist who made them. The technical side of like actually coding it is honestly probably one of the easier parts of it. The developing the idea out from 
I have this question or even what is my question to what visualization should I make is much more difficult than I think people put credit towards. Absolutely. So we'll show how to get one of those visualizations running after we've digested the information that we can find in chaos and then apply it to a problem. And then we'll show how to complete the loop. So we have a visualization, like we've already ready baked the thinking of what kind of problem, problem we want to address. We know how to actually get it running in a notebook. How do we add it to an instance of 8-naught and connect 8-naught to an available auger instance? Here's a really brief overview of the timeline today. These numbers are pretty much made up. Some things will take longer, some things will be really, really, really fast. Um, all depends on how things go. Um, so, meat and potatoes of the talk. Our motivation uh, with this whole project, the whole, like essentially our day job, is that there are challenges with working with open source communities at scale when you're an organization or you're a community member, really the, the roles aren't hugely different. Many corporate relationships with open source communities end at consuming the software and the documentation that the communities are generating, that they're creating, and that they're working really hard on. And part of the reason that it ends there is because open source communities are challenging to understand. Like when you're a brand new person, Try, or you're a brand new contributor to a project, it's really hard to dive in. There's a lot of documentation to read, there's a lot of code base to read, there's a lot of people to know. It's really not easy to get involved unless you can maybe interpret things from a higher level. Going beyond consuming these resources as just a consumer from the perspective of an organization requires a more fundamental understanding of how a community works. And so addressing that gap from our perspective, is bringing data science into the conversation. There ought to be a way to aggregate the trends that we see in communities and visualize the trends to find meaningful ways to promote community sustainability that's grounded in professional community architect strategy. Forgive me for literally writing down what I'm saying, but I want these slides to be able to be consumed later rather than just bullet points. Um, and finally, business decisions need to be in conversation with the realities that a community faces. This will hopefully prevent missteps and optimize for the shared future where a company can be invested in communities. Communities can feel that, like they're being heard by the company that consumes their resources and a more uh, equally profitable relationship can go forward. Principally, we use two tools to help make this a reality. The first part is a data collection and engineering application called Augur. Augur consumes Git, so repository data, uh, and GitHub and GitLab API data. It's one of the projects in the Chaos Project, and I think unambiguously it's owned by Professor Sean Goggins of the University of Missouri. Um, eight not is an extension of Augur. It's a data visualization and analysis application from us in Red Hat's OSPO, from us, the community data team. Uh, those are our names. So Augur started out in 2017 as a research project in chaos. The core objective of Augur was to prepare open source software project data with uh, traceable provenance and high, a high degree of verifiability. We were talking to Sean and his quip was, quote unquote, somehow, this was very interesting to numerous organizations, OSPOs, and communities. Augur has participated in Google Summer of Code for I think five years. Um, it's had a lot of contributors. It's a major part of uh, the Chaos Project, along with other great projects. Here's how Augur works in the abstract. So I'm gonna kind of break from the slides a little bit and just talk ad hoc. First step is to, for a given Git repository, clone that repository, and from the available information there, start building out a table of the contributors to the project based on the Git commits, the commits themselves, and the available files in the repository. So build out the file tree, see who has contributed to which files, 
who those contributors are, at least the information we can get from um, a git commit. It's actually from a, a, a API. I thought that they cloned it. This is a different conversation that I had with Sean. Oh, then maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, um, it has to mine certain things locally because they're oh, not of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's two major pillars. Yeah. Right. So then the second step, so we have everything that we could ostensibly mine from the Git repo itself. Then we go communicate, or Augur communicates with the GitHub and GitLab API to flesh out more of the auxiliary details. So we collect event data primarily, pull requests, comments on those pull requests, what kind of comments are being made on pull requests, issues and all the comments on those, labels on issues, et cetera. That fills out a baseline, high-level perspective of uh, community and the source code that the community works on, and then a suite of day two, so not immediate, um, like not the primary collection, but the second degree of analysis. Workers are run on that data, which provides stuff like the OSSF, OSSF scorecard and other really useful metrics. This is a really high level architecture of how Augur works. There's an Augur tool, which is quote unquote Augur, and there's a Postgres database, which is what Augur writes to, and that's the consumable resource from the work that Augur does. All of the second day data analysis goes in the database. Um, communication with GitHub and GitLab is the external interface that Augur has. So we don't go communicate with Augur, we look at the database that Augur fills in. This is a more expanded technical architecture of how Augur works. So let's go through the life cycle of a brand new request to Augur. And that kind of request could be, I want to see, I want to do a full stack collection of, let's just take an example, like the containers podman repository on GitHub or Docker Docker or whatever. So we schedule a task, that was loud, we schedule a task and one process worker picks up that task to clone the repo, mine it, et cetera. And then the data goes through multiple validation layers and finally gets populated into the database. It's a relatively simple flow with a ton of engineering behind it. Sean has said it before that it's mountains, it's tons of data carpentry on top of mountains of data. Um, so in the end, we have a, an excellent consumable resource. I want to take a pause to go look at Augur's schema so you can see kind of the high level boundaries of what data is available that Augur provides to a relatively well filled in instance. Starting with the schema. And I hope this is okay on this projector. So this is the big blown up schema view of Augur and I'm gonna start in this little quadrant where we have data on commits. So commits are referenced by a particular repository, commit hash, author name, author raw email, et cetera. I won't do it. Can you pause really quick? Yeah. Have people here ever seen a database view before? Like, like this, I just, okay. yeah, I just, wanted, to, I just wanted to take a, a quick, yeah. if there's just, Sorry it's all little lines to show how all the different boxes are are connected. Um, right. so I just wanted to make key sure relationships. Good. So I'm just doing kind of a whirlwind tour so you know the boundaries. So we got commits with all of the data that's necessary to describe a commit, issues, contributor affiliations if that information is available from GitHub, contributors, I'm gonna f go out here and look up here. The yellow boxes are usually the ones that we work with. Pull request commits, so a back reference from a pull request to the commits that make it up. Pull requests and all this crazy amount of data that describe what the actual particulars of a pull request mean, et cetera. You could go crazy in the schema. Um, and then going another step, come over here, mouse. Looking at the data just from the from dbver, so you can see the tables that are available linearly. And exactly from the schema, for instance, commits data. And indeed, we can look at
the available data and look at an example of a query. Commits are identified by their hash, so those are individual, like each hash per commit is unique. We have the author name if it's available, author raw email. You get the gist. This is the kind of data that's available in Augur. Just so that when we go on to the next step, which is visualization, you have a clear picture of what data model we're working with under the hood. So, ideally, now we have a database, and we're just going to say, okay, this exists, and we have a lot of great data about communities. The particulars of how Augur does all the verifiability layers and the validation is out of scope for this talk, as is getting Augur running, but the docs are very good for that. So we have all these events. We have commits, contributors, et cetera, but it's just a database, so we need some tool to analyze the data and prepare visualizations. And when we start talking about this, people have said, oh, yay, another data analysis application. Um, how is this going to be different from the one before, the many before? This is... I hop in for a little bit because I think sometimes it's nice to know where the project comes from and how it got started. And so in around 2020, I was brought into Red Hat as an intern. I was still in college, and I was doing a lot of one-off data requests for the OSPO team. And we were kind of all from a place of like, this is, we've never done any of this. What do we want to look at? What do we care about? And so I spent probably about the first six months just doing those one-off requests, like building stuff out directly from scratch for every single question that was had, and spent a lot of time looking at the other tooling that was available, and like looking at Augur, looking at a lot of the, a lot of the different stuff. And the biggest problem that I was having at the time was that I wanted to be able to directly access the data and to be able to like capitalize on the research and the work that's been done in data science and other fields. So pretty much looking at Python or R um, and looking at the 25 plus years of research that's been done. I'm like how I need to be able to access this data directly before I can use these packages, before I can do all the data pre-processing and be able to develop those complex visualizations and some of the more goals that Red Hat had internally around the analysis that they wanted to do around our communities. Um, and so that's pretty much how 8 Not got started, was really just trying to take data science workflow and principles that were done in other topic areas and apply it to open source communities and see where we could go with it. This is a more abstract version of that same story, but it's more of the technical considerations on top of what Callie's already said. So we went and built a new app from the ground up instead of taking advantage of some of the awesome things that already exist. And this is our rationale. So there are some absolutely fantastic applications for visualizing the data that Augur has in a relational database, specifically Postgres. Grafana, Tableau, and Superset. I've done a talk on this before. are absolutely fantastic. Um, and what they do, where they sit in this stack, is they really solve SQL-based visualization preparation. So in, in the context where you have data that is in a SQL database, or a database that's accessed with SQL, um, you can prepare a visualization, and these tools are fantastic at that. But they don't support very easily, at least we couldn't do it super ergonomically, more like ad hoc visualization pipelines. And like Callie said, we really wanted to be able to leverage the what we could find in the literature. So that would mean taking advantage of machine learning, uh, machine learning opportunities and using distributed compute and specifically working with stuff in Python native pandas because it's very accessible for people to come in and use what they already knew in school. So pandas is a huge part of that. So here, these were the packages that we were specifically excited about using and that we couldn't use in the context of Grafana and Tableau and Superset. So PyTorch, Dask, Pandas, TensorFlow, NetworkX, et cetera. So once we had committed to using some Python-based stack, we had to make a decision about how we were going to actually build a visualization app around that. There are awesome uh, frameworks for doing this, and the way that we made our decision as we looked at the range of complexity. Streamlit, who here has used Streamlit ever? 
so I know how deep I should go. So Streamlit is really cool. Streamlit is based on the concept that if you have a Python script, uh, you go from top to bottom logically, and in Streamlit, each part of a page on an app uh, gets rendered in order. So you can use any Python tools you want to render out a, a relatively simple page, and so for most applications, that's more than sufficient. You have access to the full Python data science stack, you get a really pretty performant uh, web application from it for data visualization, but on balance, we decided that it was a little bit more limited that we want, than we wanted because we wanted to have uh, more user extensibility. We wanted users to be able to have their own accounts and create groups of repositories and stuff like that, so that wasn't an ideal fit. The next level up in complexity was Plotly Dash. Most data scientist personas are very familiar with Plotly, um, and Plotly started building this web application meta framework called Dash. I'll get into those details in a minute, but spoiler alert, that's what we ended up picking. The most custom option that we probably could have picked was React plus Fast API, or React plus Flask, or any front end UI framework plus any Python back end framework, realistically. Um, but neither Callie nor I at the time was a UI designer. Not, we aren't now. No. Um, <laughs> which will be very apparent when we show you 8 knot. Um, and so we, we made the concession, okay, we're not going to roll our own UI from top to bottom, we're not gonna get super into back end, um, we're not gonna go that far at that time. So we trade the convenience of declarative Python UI development, and I'll show you what that means in a minute, which is inevitably slower than client local JavaScript UI code for the unrivaled ergonomics of the data analysis integration that Dash gives you. And again, I'm just speaking in the abstract, we'll see that literally in a minute. So um, the final conclusion was that Dash was the ideal candidate for this. And this is kind of the data flow in the abstract for how Dash works. There's one common React front end, and for every Dash application developed by everybody, it's the same. And its job is to consume information from some uh, Flask back end, or I think Julia and R are also supported. And so it takes some piece of information that says, this is the name of the component, these are the styling things for the component, this is the data that we want, and then the React front end just renders it. So all of the UI uh, reactivity to the user and everything is driven from the back end. The front end is pretty thin. Um, it's relatively slow because user interactions are done over the wire, but it's also really easy to work with because we didn't have to go learn React to get this thing booted up. It was very nice. This is how we manage scaling this, visualiza this visualization task set um, at a, high order of a higher order of abstraction. So we have the application server, which communicates with two caches, one cache that does backend processing for visualizations for us, and another that goes and collects data from Augur and then caches it. Um, we'll see a literal representation of that a little bit later. But the fundamental thing to take away from this is that 8 um, not is capable of scaling pretty arbitrarily for the amount of data you need to collect and cache and the amount of analysis you need to do for incoming consumers, and that's a lot of the Plotly Dash architectural framework that's available. So building this as a meta application where we use Augur as the data backend and 8-Not and as the visualization front end looks kind of like this. So 8-Not queries data from the Augur database, caches it, and analyzes it. The user communicates with the Flask backend with this React UI, it's all very nice and convenient. And the key observation for this is that 8 not communicates with Augur over some arbitrary distance. The expectation isn't that you deploy Augur and 8 not together. You can use one common uh, Augur backend for any arbitrary number of 8 not instances and we haven't built 8-knot with the consideration or with the expectation that 
Augur is going to be running side by side with it, which makes it really convenient for anybody to deploy their own instance of the application for their use case. So as promised, we're gonna go through a little demo of actually getting 8-Knot booted and then do a little tour and show how we connect it to Augur and how we can work with some user accounts. So if you're a user and you wanna see a specific slice of repositories on aggregate, how you can do that. Do you have a note? All of the links are on the, um, are like scale, pretty much if you look at on the scale website, on the schedule, there will be a doc with all of the links. Um, I wasn't able to figure out how to do public sharing, so everyone please request, I'm just gonna be sitting here on my email waiting for those to come in, for then everyone can get access to everything. Um, but yeah, all of the links from now until the end of this workshop should or will be available on there. And I'm gonna figure out real quick. I'm gonna mirror my displays so that we can work together on this. So, so I, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to go through that too. Um, so I'm just starting from an ep empty ish directory where I've already moved the configuration files that we'll need into it just so that it's easier and you don't have to watch me copy paste, but I'll show you where we get those uh, environment variable configuration things in a sec. So first step. I want the slide back. I don't know where that slide went. In the links, we have a reference to our source repository, which is OSS Aspen 8 knot. And we can clone, clone that. And I'm just doing it in two. Oh gosh. An access request? Yeah, so agreements having to go one by one. Oh, I see. I'm sorry, I'm just going to link to the The link is in the invite. Or in the event. So if you go onto the scale website for this for this and so we have it linked in there. and so then there that's the one link. Yeah. The ergonomics of sharing the uh, a document from the company Google Drive are not ideal. Uh, is everyone? Is anyone still waiting for link access? And if there's any point in the workshop from here on where you're like, please wait, I don't know which link. Please just raise your hand. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're running, if you're doing this on a Mac, just want to take a sec to say, start the Docker desktop application so that you have Docker running. And if you're on Linux, you probably, yeah, you already know what's up. Um, How many people have Docker on their computer already? Fabulous, okay. Okay, so change directory into the 8 knot directory. And I think it comes by default on the dev branch. Could you confirm that for me? So it starts on the dev branch, which is where we want to be. Um, and I have already prepared the environment that we're going to start out with. So I'm going to 
copy it here. But this is what we're expecting to have for this demo. So all you have to do is create a file called env.list in the top level of the 8-not directory with these credentials filled in. And all of the credentials should be in that shared links document up at the top. There's also a file that you can download as well. Don't share our passwords with anyone. They're very secret and proprietary. <laughs> All right. Anybody still need a sec? Okay, cool. So, funnily enough, we've done the hard part. Um, the only thing that remains, oh, I'm actually going to clear the screen so that's the top. Okay, this is my recommendation for like a development scale of 8 not locally. I'm gonna make that bigger. Oop. Sorry, that went to the bottom. Cool. And then when you run this, It'll take a little while to get it all built. For me, it's instant because I've already built this. Yeah. And you are fine if you just do docker compose up dash dash build. Scaling just makes it a little bit faster. Whose Docker is still building? Cool. Awesome. Anybody already done and you see like all the pretty colored text? Cool. Everything going okay over here? Oh, inevitable. Have a little bit of time with this stuff. Yeah. This is like the hardest touch point. And so yeah. everyone who wants to be following through like on their computer throughout this entire one, like raise your hand, let us come and help you. Like let's get everything, everyone's docker, this stuff mm -hmm. working. And then everything else is pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty a lot easier with the computer. As I volunteer. <laughs> yeah. Our cute little software engineer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, sure. I'm still going to take the lab off. Is Docker Desktop on on your computer? I'm downloading it. Oh, then it might. Have. Oh, but I, I just use Brew to install it. But I don't know if it. So you've got. Yeah. And is that currently running? Like you're currently installing Brew? Mm, no, it was already done. How are things? Or is your is it running for you? Yes. No. No. Brew, what, what's going on? Uh, I just have lost Docker. So you're lost. Okay. I can. I. Huh? I feel I don't know. No, I've never we'll, used we'll Docker. See, no, that's not the point. So, or brew. Yeah, sometimes. So you got both. Um, Yeah. All 
also installed the desktop as well. Oh, okay. yeah. I wasn't sure. That was just the Jupyter notebook. So this is Docker yeah, Dust? So you should have it. So yeah, I just installed everything else with it. But I didn't install Docker Dust on that one. So maybe that's why. Yeah, let's see. So yeah, Docker Dust Pop just makes everything really convenient. Okay. What's, what's the difference? So essentially, Docker, um, Docker on Mac requires that we run a virtual machine because Docker processes, like containers, don't work on Mac. So we run a Linux virtual. Well, it's it's just one of the primitives of how um, Docker works. Okay. Like containers require Linux things. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so we run a Linux virtual machine, and then Docker Desktop is the convenience. I just want, so what I'm, yeah, give me a sec. Right now what I'm just doing is your Docker is not, or your brew is not picking up the Docker um, repo. And it's, it's barely up to the I mean, you got the M3, right? This is so I just put the link in the doc. Oh, free month. Gotcha. We shall see what happens. Should work. Resources, we're going to give you eight CPUs, we're going to give you 18 gigabytes of memory, or not. and we're going to give you four <laughs> gigabytes of swap, resource saver. Sorry, I shouldn't swear to you. Okay. Uh, so you'll just have to remember that um, when Docker is running, it's consuming this much of your laptop mm -hmm. because it's running a virtual machine that big. Yeah. So now we have that. Let's see. I think maybe Brew doesn't have Docker Desktop yeah, as. Okay. Yeah. So like, I installed install Docker via yeah. Brew, yeah. and all it does is just yeah. install Docker right. Desktop. Well, that's what I would expect, yeah, but it didn't do it for it. I don't know what the deal is. There might be a different package for it. I thought maybe the repos were out of date, so it didn't. I don't know. I This is beyond my awareness. <laughs> So, cool, so I'm good, I'm not caught up. You should be good, like this was the hardest part. Did you, okay. did you have the cast? Yeah, we yeah. tried, yeah. Nothing. I don't know. Weird, thank you. Yeah, if you have any further problems, let me know. Yeah, cool.
this is why we hired a software engineer. Because <laughs> before it was me. And I was like, this is not going to work out well for anybody. James, right here. Have you ever had a not running on your computer before? Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, this is gonna be great. Hey, and that's and this is and that's why I've very much been like you're not the only one of being like for this and for the one for OSSNA. There's a lot of people where I'm like, if you just want to get up and running and don't want to figure any of this out yourself, this is it. This will be the easiest three hours of your time to be completely set up and ready to go. Oh my God! You'll, I'm, I'm ex I think you'll, you'll. It'll be. I'll be very curious to see what your thoughts are about the first response visualization because we're literally going to be diving super deep into that one because, um, like the you know the puzzle piece slide that I do it for ours. That's pretty much, we're doing that live. We're taking the pieces of two uh, and, ch and switching out PRs and issues yeah. to make a new visualization. Because um, then you're able to kind of see the power of having a structural database and being able to see, okay, I like, I want to see this visualization on a similar but different amount of data. How quick you can just switch things out and then you have the whole, a whole new visualization, a whole new view of things. Should be fine. <laughs>
if any of the people who are, if you're not able to fully build, if you could open an issue on 8Knot, documenting what your setup is, and uh, just screenshots, that'd be really, really great and helpful for them. We can actually spend some time figuring out why that's happening if we're not able to fix it live. I know that's not super helpful for you right now, but that is very helpful for us in making sure that this is like, yes. <laughs> Because I mean, both of him, we both have the same exact computer setup, so it makes it. He's really good with like doing a lot of different virtual machines and trying things out, but in the day to day, pretty much most people who are working on it are on Mac and like the specific like the same chip and everything. So the problems you'll run in on different computers. New. But I mean, seriously, you do. It's gonna be great. It's so helpful. Yeah, you're you're good. I know you're good. I saw yours. That's like the that's the funny thing is I like when it works, you're just like joop, and then you're done. And then whenever it doesn't, you're like I don't know if I can ever make it out of the black box. Okay. We should cross validate on other operating systems and stuff at some point. That's why I was I was pretty much doing a call for. If anybody is, is it working on a yeah. so yeah. yeah. For them, we can go through all of that like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if we can go, because we can go through that before OSX and X. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, for those of you who have gotten past the build phase, we can have the payoff, which is going to any local host, so 0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 or 127.0.0.1 or the worst word localhost. Word the word local host. Defined, and this is, this is the predefined one, isn't it? Mm -mm. No, 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 I'm just saying any host, any local host, and then port 8080. And that's where it lives. And then it'll start saying this, essentially like, oh, we're collecting stuff. Uh, and that'll take a little while. Right. We're going to expect y'all to clap like that. <laughs> Not really. So in an ideal world, it is that easy. It's move your environment variable into the root and then compose it up, and it just kind of pops up for you because it goes and connects to Augur. If you have a problem, all of the visualizations when you go, ch or it'll like complain a bunch in the logs, but the visualizations will also go like, <laughs> like nothing works. But it's, it's less of a black box and more of a complain in one place violently fail in <laughs> so that it doesn't do anything dumb in the front. Like it'll complain like a developer would expect it to. But anyway, so right now, actually not gonna pause. Did you guys make any progress over there? Yeah. Was it the VM size? Okay. Oh. Phenomenal. Okay, cool. And what about for you? Okay. Oh, 
heartbreaking. You're still going to do it? Oh, God. What did I do? Okay. There's just like um. There's a mysterious black control up here that's very sensitive. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll just keep moving forward here and do a little tour of the visualizations that are available out of the box. Um, that's where I'm going. So there's a lot of features in 8 Knot that aren't immediately obvious because they're either baked into Plotly or they're, um, they're not enabled by default. So we're just gonna do a little tour of what those are so you know where to get started with them. Um, so using any individual visualization, we're gonna use all the nice features that Plotly gives us. So we can fo focus in on an area and that'll select a smaller window of the data that's available. Double clicking on it will exit the focus so we go from zoomed in to zoomed back out. We can deselect categories of data by clicking on the legend, which is over here. And then we have a little toolbar up at the top, which is up here. And this will be clearer in full, full resolution. But we can do a bunch of stuff with it, scale, take a PNG, et cetera. And then we have a little card at the bottom of every graph that describes what the graph is supposed to be showing and like our very abstract interpretation of how you can use it. This goes into a breakdown of what each of the individual pages are kind of for. Um, generally, it's hard to categorize these visualizations into like one specific angle or facet. So these are very gentle divisions, mostly so that no individual page is super overwhelmed. We have a separate section of what? Yeah. we're really trying to work on. And you'll probably hear me stop throughout the rest of this presentation at places to where we're really looking for feedback to help develop this project. And then we'll see this in a minute. Well, we have Augur accounts. There's a notion of using Augur as a user preferences backend, which is very convenient. So like I said before, you can group different repositories together. So if you're always going and checking out the five CNCF projects, or you're always checking out your group of projects. You don't have to always put them all in the search bar together and waste, some, waste a couple cycles on that. So why doesn't the, um, the default legend already have that for the other Right, so in general, we make that a, an opt-in thing. The reason that we didn't configure it, and we will configure it in just a minute to do that, is because it requires a lot of configuration stuff that supports this thing called the OAuth 2.0 flow that we don't want to just like dump on you out of the gate. We have to specify a ton of URLs and go through the process of linking your app to Augur in a reasonable way. So we're just starting with a clean slate. Good question though. And then this is just like how you go add a user group if you want to add a new group for yourself. There's a hosted instance of it, and if you want repositories that you specifically care about in that database, you can add them in by using the user groups. Yar. So by default, in the configuration that we gave you, we're starting with the target repo set organization as the chaos project. So that lives up here. If we want to select another thing, like chaos auger, for instance, we can go select it like this, and it's the GitHub URL that points directly to it. Alternatively, if you want to slice by an org, 
like we have for chaos. There's like Kubernetes. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Kubernetes isn't available in this database, but we can look at other stuff like Swift Kelsey, for instance. I don't know what all the orgs are in here, but like, for instance, on our public, publicly available instance, we have like Kubernetes and Kubernetes SIGs and containers, et cetera. And then if you want uh, Podman, Container slash pod, man. I don't know. Anyway, it's there. Um, so we're starting off with the chaos organization, and we can break it down so we can say, okay, in the chaos organization, this is the overview of the programming languages that are used. This looks at all of the files and breaks down their type. Augur does this for us. What the package versions are, like how old they are, and then below we have per repo analysis. So right now we're looking at Grimoire Labs sorting hat but if we want to look at Augur, for instance, which is what Kelly and I are most familiar with, uh, Augie, let's see. Oh, nice. Augur. This one's for Augie. I think when we built this database, it didn't include Augur specifically, but Here's the scorecard for it, OpenSSF scorecard, and some general repo. So what license it uses, if it has a code of conduct, whether or not it has like a contributors.md file, and that's how we check for this. Does it have a security policy, et cetera. And then we have a page that slices by contributor contribution statistics. We just call it the contributions page. Pull request activity, which includes some axis and concept of staleness, how old a pull request is, you can parameterize that for yourself. So you might say, there's no way I'm calling a PR stale after seven days. It's actually gonna be 37 days and it'll re-render for you. Um, and this errors and says, okay, days until staling is less than days until stale. So maybe we'll make that 60 days. And then, okay, our number of stale pull requests decreases relative. Um, because the, we increase the days until staling range, for instance. We can track the number of pull requests over time as a trend, merged versus closed, and I won't go into s tremendous detail on each of these. Um, issue activity, how much issue backlog is building up in the project, and look at the trends to see how many issues were closed versus opened. We can see like, okay, the trend decreases dramatically, and we can see a bunch got closed, a bunch of issues got closed issue assignment status, et cetera. And then some of the more interesting, like, deep dives on pull request conversation engagement are available. So as PRs get opened, how many are having a response, are getting a response from not the PR opener within two days, for instance, or say 20 days? This will take a little sec, a little bit to render. You see, okay, pretty much the same case, like it's, we're not seeing a huge gap. And then we slice by contributor statistics. Some of these are a little bit more, a little too detailed to go into like verbally in this presentation, but we encourage you to go check out like the about section to see what the details are, but we can see, hey, new contributors by month. Um, new contributor types over time, are they showing up repeatedly or are they showing up like a couple times and then leaving and we haven't seen them since. Contributors by action type, so how many contributors were opening a PR in this span, April 2023? How many were reviewing a PR? Number goes down because there are fewer reviews than there are open PRs, et cetera. And one of the most exciting pages that Callie and I developed, and mostly Callie developed, was this slice of organizational affiliation in a given project. So we can actually take a second look exactly at what we know the most about, which is OSS Aspen slash 8 knot, so that's our project, which will go collect the data, cache it in 8 knot, and we can look at what the statistics are and see, okay, you know, Callie and I know exactly who contributes to this project so we can inform what these things mean. Unique contributor email domains, 
So 22% of the domains are redhat.com, 17% are Gmail, users, no reply, github.com, other. You kind of expect to see these. Yeah. I was going to say that this page looks pretty well at like the idea that a lot of times whenever it comes to community or anything that you're analyzing, you're not going to be able to directly answer the question that you would like. Everyone would love to know at the very, like being like, this is the, the exact amount of contributors that are, these ones are working at this company and these people are working as individuals. That's just not realistic but you can look at different slices of it, look at, okay, how many unique domains are being used? What is the breakdown by the different types of contributions? You can look at it from a bunch of different angles and get a really good holistic view towards that, like be able to understand what the landscape looks like without being able to answer that direct question. Um, and so I think this is like a pretty good example of the type of care and the type of analysis that's like, what it actually happens and what is you're able to get to. For me, one of the most useful examples of that is, of this question, like the problem with the question of organizational affiliation and Augur's value proposition and the data analysis that we do is actually this visualization where we try to associate activity in the project to individual uh, emails associated with uh, multiple emails on an account. It's a lot to digest, so I'll break it down. So in this visualization, we see this column where it says, okay, for redhat.com, there are 3,021 contributions. What that means is that in this project, there are 3,000 contributions attributable to user accounts that are associated with at least one Red Hat email. So that's ostensibly Callie and I. That includes issues, pull requests, commits, etc. The same is for this users.noreply.github, so there are that many events associated with an account that has that. So all of these columns are kind of double counting, but it gives you a really clear picture of, okay, this email domain generally is associated with this volume. And it could mean that someone could have many different affiliations, so I know that I'm a bu.edu email, and roughly 50% of my time on this project was using that BU email. Um, and so that kind of makes sense. And you can see like my MacBook Pro got put into the uh, commit history, so you can actually see it. But it's really, really useful to see slices like this to help paint a broader picture of affiliation in a project. And then um, this is... Yeah. So this page digests one of the cool perspectives that is available on the Chaos website. So all of these visualizations on this page, and we've only implemented two, come directly from definitions from the Chaos project. So Lottery Factor analyzes the top 10 contributors by commit. So, <coughs> excuse me. These commit hashes are respective of different individuals in our project, or excuse me, in chaos, that have done some proportion. So they've done at least 10, uh, or at least K contributions and how many they've done. And then roughly 50% of the total contributor base um, is outstanding. And then when we look at project velocity, we look at the axes of number of commits on a logarithmic scale versus PR and issue actions. We can see, okay, uh, up and to the right ostensibly means more velocity. So Grimoire Elk has 3,300 commits and 900 PRs. Um, let's see, where does Augur live? Oh, Augur's not in this slice. That's okay. Um, we see like the layout generally of how big the projects are in the common set that we're looking at, how much, uh, how much volume of contribution they see, et cetera. Issues, 
a bunch of different data contribution types into one visualization and able to weight those contributions in different ways. That's kind of the level of analysis that made us really want to use a Python environment. So those type of things with the tool, like with the, a lot of the more built-in dashboard tooling that was available, we weren't able to do that aggregated analysis to be then populated yeah. into the visualizations. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this page as well. This, I think this is a good example of another of, of that next phase analysis that we like to talk about. Uh, this is a heat map series. You can look at the different um, about graphs, but it looks at activity in a repository, not just at like a higher level. It's looking at it as at a like directory to file level, and you can choose which view you want to have on it. But you can see, okay, how long has it been since somebody has contributed to this section of the code? How long has it been since they've been active anywhere? Do you have sections of your code base that are in the contention to be unmaintained. Do you have people who are contributing a lot that maybe should now be reviewers? And you know that your reviewer base is going down because of the combination of these three different views on your contributor activity and your code base. And so this is like each one shows a different view and put all together allows you to have the information that you would need to make preventative actions that could help your community out. So then it's not that I don't know, 50 PRs are open to a certain section of the code base, and that's how you figure out that you no longer have a maintainer that is familiar or aware of that of that area, or if you have some people that you should probably be um, giving more responsibility in your community, giving more opportunities. Um, and so this is something that we finished more recently, and yeah, I think that kind of shows where we would like to go with the visualizations and the analysis that we're doing. Yeah. So this, wow, that was loud. Um, this is a series of three visualizations that I would actually start with uh, this one to like ramp up complexity from relatively simple upward. So this is just a heat map of activity in the code base by number of contributions. So this looks at PRs opened per subsection of the repo at a given level. So right now we're at the very top of Grimoire Lab sorting hat, which is a project from Grimoire Lab. Uh, and we see, okay, in the directory sorting hat, one PR was opened in September 2023, for instance. So we break it down by pure heat map. And then reviewer heat map looks at the same idea, but how many PRs were reviewed targeting a specific subcomponent of the project. And finally, contributor file heat map is exactly what Callie was describing, which is the interpretability thing is kind of better verbal for me. So here we see, okay, um, the last time three contributors to the Grimoire Elk uh, folder in this project were seen was June 2020, for instance, which helps you look at this and backdate say, okay, last time we saw these contributors anywhere in the project to the schema directory was June 2020. And we can say, okay, these people are no longer showing up in the project. Uh, and identify, oh, uh, there's relatively few people for the utils package or utils subdirectory that have been around in a while. There's only one person that's been a w around. That could be a problem for us. And then for any definitions that you need for like inspecting these graphs, we have a page of all of the definitions that we use. That's a really big overview of the application. Um, and all of the faculties that come with it without extending it to include uh, Augur accounts. What I'm gonna do now is, and I'm not expecting this to be a follow along because it requires going and essentially registering the app with, uh, with an Augur instance, so we're just gonna kinda skip that. Um, and I'm gonna just show it to you as an example. Um, I'm gonna rebuild Oh yeah, I'm moving on in like five minutes. Yeah. You can force stop this stuff. This is my recommended way of bringing everything down. So Docker compose down dash dash volumes, which will clean up all of the Postgres cache things along with all of the running containers. 
okay, whatever. Um, so I'm going to copy back here to it. So I have this new environment where I include all of the stuff needed for OAuth. Um, we're connecting to the same database. What I'm going to do is use the credentials that I have for a previously registered instance to go communicate with the Augur uh, registration endpoint and then re-register this application as a net new thing. You'll just see what that means in a sec. So same way to boot this back up, just with different credentials. And now we have this new thing up here that has Augur login and sign up, refresh groups, manage groups, log out. All of those are disabled for the time being. And I'm just going to log out so we can start from scratch. So we go to this page and we're greeted by the Augur front end. And the Augur front end lets you manage eight, eight not instances registered with a given Augur database as uh, um, extended endpoints uh, and manage your user groups, etc. So I have an account previously created with this. And normally, if we were just logging in, we would just do this OAuth um, authorization flow. But I'm going to short circuit that to go through the process of registering a new application. So I have this connected app that I don't want to use. We're going to create a new application. I'm going to do it not scale demo. And the redirect URL is where the OAuth flow will try to go back to with a code that's needed to authenticate your user. Uh, because I'm using this locally, all I need to give it is what the route is to my local web server or application server. So HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon. And we run it on 8080. Validating that. Yep, 8080. And based on the definition that OAuth likes, the slash authorize endpoint is what we make available. Create this, and I've got this new application, 8 not scale demo. I need to replace some credentials. We've got this application ID, and I have to bring down the web server to just restart this with the correct application ID. I can change it here, and then change it here, and then change it here. All we're doing is changing where it says like client ID or app ID. And then we need our app ID, or excuse me, the client secret. That gets replaced here and here. And that should be it. Now we can bring up this new application that's registered with Augur. Doo -doo -doo. We're just going to watch this connected users thing in a minute. And now we're authorizing our user account to go use this instance of Augur that we've registered. When we come back with our user account, we have my username, Jay Kunstel, up here. And here in connected users, it says, okay, we have one connected user using this Augur at, or this particular Augur instance. So what's the point of these user accounts then? Well, like I've said a couple times, what if I don't want to always have to put in like OSS Aspen slash 
8 naught and OSS Aspen slash repel are two projects. I don't want to do that every single time. So I have the ability to go into Augur and create this demo scale group two. You can see that I rehearsed this. So we have this guy and we have no repos in this group. And if we add uh, OSS Aspen slash eight knot and OSS Aspen slash repel to scale group two, we have two repos now added to this. We can see for repel and eight knot, we have issues and commits associated with it. We know that the data is available. If the data is not available, then Augur will have these two as zeros, which just means data is collecting. Augur, we're working on extending that, so it'll say data collecting more literally, but that's just what that means if you see that. And then we can ref refresh the group, and then under my username, I have scale group one, scale group two. If I select that, search for it, we have these two repos as the aggregate set, which is really convenient because now I don't have to look that up again. And it, we've had some uh, user stories where people want to slice, like I said earlier, specifically on CNCF incubating statuses, for instance. Same with uh, the Apache Software Foundation. Like, want to see what the activity has been in the Apache Software Foundation attic projects, like the stuff that should be EOL, like are people still interested in that? That's a slice that people have asked for specifically. So that pretty much wraps up this part of the demo. Um, my recommendation is that if you're interested in signing into Augur and going through this user groups um, workflow, work through the docs, see if there's something that's not ergonomic and you don't like it and let us know. If it's great, also let us know because we'd love to know that. Um, some things will probably be extended in the near future just for API simplification, like um, this will change because we essentially reference the same endpoints twice for two overlapping implementations of OAuth for different things that support both ends, um, or two contexts, so that'll change, but otherwise a lot of things should be the same if you go play with it. Anyway, thank you so much for following along with me up to this point. Really hope that you learned something about the, the data visualization stuff we do, um, and you can go use 8 Knot and contribute to it at your leisure, and then I'll turn it over to Callie for the second part of this talk. Okay, whatever. Do you want the lav?
more at like a conceptual level, how would you start to build them out? And then we're gonna go from start to finish, building our own visualization, um, from taking in the chaos documentation, looking at some of the visualizations that already exist in 8 Knot, and taking all the resources that are available together to put and make a new visualization. Um, but first, we're gonna talk about it more from a conceptual um, angle, and so this portion, we're just gonna be talking about the value of community metrics, the methodology, and just the different analysis lessons learned type moments. Um, I think this will be good as well for people who aren't as familiar with maybe community or community metrics at all, of like kind of some of the different angles that you might wanna consider if you're starting to do community metrics um, on a community, with a community that's never done that before. And so first we're kind of looking at what can these strong, these um, community metrics start to enable. And first, we are looking at just building on the community knowledge. Um, like data analysis and this type of optimization of getting this information is not gonna be the one thing that informs your community decisions. It really shouldn't be. It should be something that helps enable them. It should take things, and this is something that I've taken, I've gotten from experience of things that might take 10, 20 hours to manually look into, or things that if you don't have the data behind it, you will never be able to actually confirm. Those are the things that can be really helpful when you start to have this um, community knowledge. You take what you already know, you're able to confirm some intuitions that you have, and be able to make better decisions, and honestly, quicker decisions. You can leave the step of discussing it. If something is happening, you're able to say, okay, I can see in X, Y, and Z way that this is happening. Now what are we going to do about it? Next portion we kind of talk about is staying informed in a sustainable way. Um, I feel like anybody who works in communities or otherwise, we all have a thousand and one things to do to keep up with. If it is not a maintainable process, if it's not something that you have time for, you're not going to keep up, you're not gonna keep up with it. So a lot of the different visualizations that I think about making is about, okay, what is a large 20 hour process? Is there a way that I can make it a five minute process? And how would I go about doing it? And the last thing is just filtering through just the amount, the massive amounts of data. I feel like there's a lot of pressure to use data, to make data-driven decisions. You have all of this mountain of information. Now what are you going to do about it? It can be very stressful and hard to even, I mean, if you think about the auger schema, you look at it in a huge view and you're like, this is just the tables. Like, how do I even get started? How do I use this um, in an intelligible way? And so those are kind of some of the stuff we start thinking about. The next things is looking at what type of perspective um, you want to be able to gain or share by these metrics. Um, and the one thing, you, another, one of the first things you wanna start thinking about is, is your goal to gain information or to influence action? Um, is there an area of your community that's not understood and you're just trying to take that first step or getting there? Or is there like an initiative that you're trying to just decide on or something that's already, initiative that's already happening that you're trying to see the impacts? And so those are kind of the, one of the first things I start thinking about. And the second one is thinking about if you want to expose areas of, of improvement or highlight your strengths. There is times when you really want to hype up your community, show it how great it is. I'd say as a OSPO within a larger company, there are times when we want to be able to highlight just all of the wonderful things about X, Y, and Z community and really show it in a way that's accessible. Um, and But that's those type of metrics, looking at all of it from being the hype up, the, the things that make it look great. That might not be the same type of metrics that you wanna look at when informing your community decisions. If that's, you're trying to show maybe some shortcomings or trying to inform yourself on things that you could do better, looking at things that just tell you how great you are isn't gonna really be helpful in that process. And so there's a time and a place for highlighting strengths and there's a time and a place of trying to figure out where your shortcomings are. Um, and the last thing you wanna look at, we kind of go into earlier, is looking at community impact versus the business impact. Um, businesses are used to seeing numbers and data. I have seen in a lot of our conversations just having 
the data behind what we're saying whenever we're talking to more of the business-minded people within Red Hat. It is something they're familiar with. It's something that gets them to be like community isn't this big, scary thing that we don't understand and super unstructured. Those are the things that make it seem more accessible and put value behind the things that we are saying. Um, and then you can look at it from how is your community impacting open source overall? How does it look at the ecosystem? And so those are, it's, those are kind of some of the things you want to consider. And I would say these aren't always an either or situation, um, but these are the type of framing that you wanna do when you're developing a very deliberate metric. And so for then it doesn't start getting, it, there's just a lot going on. So, so trying to really hone in on what your individual goals are for each visualization or set of visualizations you make starts to make this a more manageable process. So first we're going to be like this portion of it, we're gonna be looking at the codifying the projects and the metrics. Um, we can talk about like debate, there's a lot of different tooling. We've talked about some of the different ones for this workshop. We're gonna be looking at Augur and 8Knot, um, but there's always room for debate on that stuff. But this section, if you use a completely different tool chain, all the things that I'm saying still apply. Um, and so right here is where we wanna start thinking about what do you actually wanna know, what data is accessible and a thoughtful execution of the data analysis. And so we'll kind of go into some different analysis angles. And these are just some examples. There are a lot of different, different things that you can look at, um, but they can be kind of generally applied to different situations. And so first we have our scenario, I call it 1A, is that you're building off of current data analysis. Um, you've already started to go down this path within your community of looking at different visualizations, and then let's see, figure out that iterative process to make it better. Um, the idea here is to build off some of the more common or traditional open source community analysis, commits over time, that's cool to know, but what does that actually show you or tell you or give you any way to make action from? Um, at that point, it's just a base number. And so let's say you have some of the examples, we have contributors over time. Say you have that value of knowing that there are 120 total contributors over the lifespan of an entire project. And that's a value you can put on a slide, but how do you take a step further to be able to make decisions off of it? Um, and then, so this is like, the first step would be numbers over time, then you could take it the next step further, and we've actually seen some of these visualizations, is looking at the active versus drifting contributors from all the contributors have been active or have been involved in the project, how many of them have been involved in the last six months, last 12 months? Is that value staying consistent? Is your active contributor base going down? That now starts to tell you something more in depth about your community and being able to make some more decisions off of. If your active contributor base just got cut in half in the last year, something's happening and you wanna investigate more. Um, another example of this is like the commits over time. Um, you can start looking at um, the commits by maybe a subset of the contributors. That's the lottery factor or the bus factor. Is there a very small portion of your contributor base that is the, like, I don't know, 50, 70% of those commits? That's a lot to be on a singular person, and it's also a lot of risk. What happens if that person leaves? And if you don't know who that person is, that's also the first step because you want to make sure that they aren't going anywhere. Um, or starting to be able to figure out how could you take their knowledge to teach other people seeing who else is involved. Um, the one B of this, um, this is something that I've actually just started talking about, um, which is just building off of prior work. There is work from a conceptual standpoint under chaos. A lot of other people have made visualizations and metrics. And so from a conceptual side or from a technical side, you can start to take things from like a structural similarity standpoint. So I have a little bit of a visualization with the um, puzzle pieces where it all goes together, but you're only changing one part out. A good example of this is time to first response. Um, what you can take what you do conceptually from PRs and apply it to issues. And whenever you're using a structured database like we are, that makes it to where even from a technical standpoint, and we're gonna walk through this 
um, that's gonna be our visualization we're gonna build actually, um, is how to take all of the code and how to take the queries and make that one change so now you have a brand new visualization and how to start taking in those resources to make a more complex visualization or more informed visualization but also not to repeat work because um, nobody likes that. Um, another way of thinking about this is from a data similarity. Um, a lot of times from your visualizations you might have a bunch of pieces that um, make, like for context, the, there's an, the PR review assignments, that was one of the visualizations, and that looks at um, the assignments per contributor, so you know if there's a vast majority of those assignments going to one contributor, trying to understand that the v same data and pretty much the same code can be applied to do the status counts. So seeing, okay, over the span of a month, how many PRs are being assigned or unassigned at all. And so you're not even, you're not looking at it from the contributor standpoint, you're looking at well, editor. Um, you can see by how long this is taking to load, um, why we use a materialized view, because it's kind of, it is a complex, um, like layering, because you have a column for, or not a column, but a row for every single message that, or comment, however you wanna like think about it, on a PR. Um, and it also will exist if there is no messages at all associated with a PR. Um, let's, things are happening. So this is just to be able to see what that query would look like. So you have like your pull request ID, the ID of that repository, what the contributor, which contributor contributed a, um, or that's the contributor for the pull request, and then this is the message that is associated with that PR, and then the person who sent that message or made the comment, and then we have our information about when a PR was created and closed. Um, so it's actually a little bit simpler to do it from the issue standpoint than the PRs because there is no reviews and issues. Um, and so I'm gonna do a little bit of black magic, because I have a feeling that this, I will take, yeah, um, as somebody told us in a company meeting recently, um, the baking show version of um, tutorials. And so I pretty much, when I d developed this visualization the first time and went about um, anytime I do the, like kind of make a new query, I look at the structure of things that I already know and then I start translating. Um, in this case, there's pretty much a direct mapping to, oh, wait, this is not the one that I wanted. Pretend like you're not seeing this notebook that I'm about to open. It definitely doesn't exist and I've, I'm doing this all live with you for the first time. That's the one thing the mirroring doesn't allow you to have any movie magic. <laughs> so, well, this is the query that I was talking about. And if you look at it, it looks very structurally similar to the one that you just saw for the PRs. This is PRs, and this is um, the issues version of this. Um, what I ended up doing to be able to develop this was I went line by line for the PRs version, and then I just did the translation to the issues table. So you can kind of see up here, like issue, pull request ID. Actually, I think I might be able to open this in a, no, sad. I was hoping it was gonna let me do a um, additional opening up for to see them next to each other, but, um, we'll be looking at, you kind of like can be able to see, this is the pull request repo ID, the contributor ID, so on and so forth, and that's pretty much the exact thing that I did. I just looked at the PR table, and I looked at the issue table, and I did the direct translation over, and did it to where we were able to get the messages, which is the comments, that are associated with each of the issues. Um, and so there's just a, it's pretty much a little translation from PRs to that issues um, building. So the next step in doing this, once you have your query that you wanna work with, take this, 
Um, and then we will put it into our Plotly tutorial notebook in the exact same way. Um, there's a link directly in that document to the completed version of this, um, vis of this um, visualization notebook of any of the things that I copy and paste over you want to be able to do locally or I can end up um, putting it in the document as well. Just communicate with me and let me know. Um, so yeah, so this is what we have here. Now we have our import for the repo statement. We have our query and let's run the query and see what happens. So if you've ever used Jupyter Notebooks before, when the number pops up, that means that that cell has run. Um, and so now we can see, and that's that, the query that we saw in the database um, editor. So now that we have our query to work with, let's kind of go back to the resources that we have available to us and see how they process the information for the PRs. So I'm actually just gonna go and take this whole process data section and go and put it in here. And so then we can all just take a look at the code that processes that query, the query of data that we just looked at. Um, I've been talking a lot. I'm gonna pause for a second to make sure people how are, just keep on going. You're lost. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so sorry. The SQL, the, um, even with doing the build, did, yeah, I, I, that's, I, I've told, I've told James, I've told James this that I almost exclusively like working in like virtual environments like this so then whenever I screw up I can just destroy it and have no consequences for my actions um, because I have completely I'm I'm ter I just do you want to know why I do this I destroyed the computer the filing system on my computer in college completely using Jupyter notebooks um, so that's when I learned that I needed to put myself in a playpen and um, because I cannot be trusted with anything locally. Um, so that makes sense. Um, please then, if you're not able to do it locally, you're gonna be the person that's gonna be following this the most. I know, stop me. Whenever you're like, I don't know why you just did this, Callie, just raise your hand and let's talk about it. Um, oh yeah, we can do that. We can talk through that as well. Um, also, it might just be that a good idea to get a Jupyter Notebook environment running for OSSNA, we'll see. There's another conference that we're doing this at, so. A little bit of a content breather pause. We can get back at it. Um, so we have our notebook. We're in the tutorial notebook that has all the structure here. We made our query to go and get the data directly from Augur. And now we are looking at the code that was for the PR's first request, the, um, the PR's first response, and looking about how that maps to issues. So if we just go line by line, um, this right here is just converting everything to a pandas date time object. Um, if you've ever worked with pandas or any type of date time, it is a nightmare, and so I pretty much opt to always converting to a consistent daytime object to know that everything's going to play nice. Um, and so we know we're working with issues and not PRs. So honestly, whenever I go about doing this, I'm just gonna see where PR is. And now we know we don't want a PR created at, we want just created at, because that's the, the data that we have now. So I'm just gonna go and change this over to created at. And then we're doing the closed at. And so the next step that we'll be doing is looking at this next line of code. And we want to drop the messages from the time before was the PR creator, but now we're looking at the issue creator. Because if we're looking at people's first response, we don't want the messages that say somebody opened that issue and they went and they were the first person to comment something because what it always happens. We don't want that to be a part of our data because that's not a first response, that's themselves. Um, and so the next thing that we'll kind of go through is looking at, or we want to sort all of our information 
and um, looking at it by sorting by that t message timestamp, since that's the thing that we really want to look at. Um, and we want to drop the duplicates because we're only looking at the first. So instead of pull request ID, we can see that we just want the issue ID. Issue ID. And then we want to be able to get that first and last element in the um, data frame. So we want to know which one was the, the earliest issue created and what was the latest issue created or closed um, to be able to get that date range fully of, okay, what is the earliest issue we have? What is the latest issue we have to be able to do the um, iteration across? And so looking at these comments, um, I'm gonna actually gonna edit all of this right now. This is why I just do a little comment. So then now we have, we are editing all of the comments that go with the code. So somebody can walk through this the same way that I'm walking through it right now on this next visualization. So we're opening, we're having a new data frame um, that actually I went a couple two steps too far, my bad. Um, for now with the earliest and latest dates, we're going to use pandas to get a date range. So this is pretty much going to give us a date uh, column for every single day from that start date to that end date. And so we're setting up a data frame to be able to put all of our information into to be able to build a visualization. Um, and so that's, we got that date range and we're creating that into a data frame. Um, and this is for then whenever we get down to this next step, and if you look at it for PRs and then we're about to translate it to issues, um, we're gonna do some, we're gonna look at every single day and see for that specific day how many issues are open and how many of those have gotten a response within our defined, like care, our defined timeline. So if we look at the PR first response one, the initial response days is two. So we have how many PRs are open and how many PRs have gotten a response within that two day threshold. And so we're gonna go back over to here. Which one? This one? Oh, thank you. Beautiful. You can ask ask James. Spelling is really is really my strong suit. It's honestly where I um there may or may not be about five commits for this um, notebook that was purely me trying to spell response correctly. Um, <laughs> I wish I was joking. Um, so what we're looking at here, um, I don't know how familiar or like how familiar y'all are with Python. Um, but this is pretty much just applying a function to every single row in the data frame. This is something that I started to do a lot with these visualizations and really allows for the, some more complex analysis. So we see here that there is a function that we're applying to the entire data frame. We don't have that function in our notebook yet, so let's go and get the PR version of it and start to dive into what that means. How much, where are we at time-wise? Okay. Okay. Can you give me like a 10 minute point from right here? Um, <laughs> Cause we might have to do some more. Cause I want to be able to show y'all how to integrate all of this into 8 knot, but I also want y'all to know what the code means um, since we're kind of just translating over. Um, but we're doing applying this function to every column and so we can look at what is this function in the context of um, PRs. So this function takes the date and determines how many PRs are um, open and, and how many of them have a response within a number of days, which is perfect because that seems that's exactly what we want except for issues. And so we kind of can start going through this pretty quickly. I'm gonna do the same little plug and play of, of changing over from PRs 
to just the issues version of it, which pretty much just means deleting PR from everything. Um, but pretty much what this is doing is looking at a singular day. We're dropping all of the columns that have been created or all of the issues that have been created after the date that we're looking at. We're dropping all of the columns that have been closed before the date that we are looking at. Um, and then we also want to include all of the PRs, but in this case, all of the issues that have not been closed yet. Um, yes. Is that, um, then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be open on that day anymore. It'd be closed, so it would never get past that second conditional. No, because it's we're only looking at what do, uh, what PRs are open on that day, and then as of that day, have they been responded to? So, in the situation where the first response is a merger closed, that means that it's no longer open, so it wouldn't be counted in this scenario. Yeah, because it, I guess it's like we're trying to compare like how many are currently open and how many have an, a response within the time interval. Um, and I guess that's going to be the difference between looking at something over a month and looking at something versus on a day. Is that then, because in, in our scenario, that means that the issue is closed or the PR is closed. And so then it doesn't apply to this visualization anymore. Um, but yeah, so we'll kind of go back into this one. We're looking at the PRs being open, closed, uh, making sure that we're only looking at the ones that are actively open. And then for the ones that are actively opened, if they have a response within the time interval that we've defined, which is number of days. Um, and so that's kind of what each of these steps is going towards. I'm trying to be a little bit more efficient with my time because I want to go more into the eight knot side of things. Um, but pretty much we can look at the overall um, this function that is being applied to each of the columns. And so that's how you'll get for every single day a um, data frame with how many are open and how many have a response. And so I'm actually going to pop over to the um, notebook that we have already built out, which is line by line what we just did um, to save us a little bit of time. But here is that number of days. Here is all of the translation over that's pretty much just as me removing the PR from every single line of this. Um, and then you can see what that data frame looks like whenever you apply that function. And so you have for every date, you have how many are open and how many have a response within that, what we have defined as two days. And so that's how we get that initial data frame to be able to populate our visualization. And so the next thing that we'll be doing to populate the visualization is that I'm just gonna take the code from the create figure section. Because um, this is where all of that code to do from process data section for every single visualization is where you process the data and turn it into a data frame to be put into the visualization. And then now you have your sectioned out visualization stuff to be able to build a plotly visualization. So if we look at this and compare it to what we've done for PRs, kind of looking line by line. This is um, all in Plotly. Um, one thing I find very interesting about Plotly visualizations is that you're pretty much just building on top of each other. Like you can make, you can say like any, like this one's like a go figure or you can do a Plotly express visualization and define a pie chart. And then you can just start building your customizations on top of it like updating your layout or defining very, like their documentation is honestly phenomenal. And I just go and be like, I wanna move, I wanna make my pie chart 20% bigger. And then it tells me exactly how I build um, that customization on top. Um, so what we'll do here is go and instead of issue PRs, we're doing issues are open. Um, the date, the open, the lines, we want the PRs to be issues. Response, response, PRs, issues. And this will make sense more when we get there, but we haven't defined a color sequence in this um, notebook, and we're just trying to make sure everything works. So then it makes the process over an eight on a little bit easier. 
So I'm gonna make sure this has all been run because I don't think it has been. Yeah, I guess this is the other notebook. This is what I get, but. Yeah, you're right. Workshop. Because then it's in a different location. Cool. I'm just running all the same things as before, so we don't have to go through it. Let's see, why is it mad at me? Oh, because I haven't defined the... So that's what we just did did in the other notebook. I just wanted to have something that was already pre-built so then we can actually work in 8 knot. Um, so this is making the the database, or not the database, but the data frame. And then this is going to build the visualization. And now we can see, okay, it's mad at me because I just went and took this directly over. And in the 8 knot, it's just DF, and this is DF responses. And so this is how I do the movie magic. And when I tell you this is exactly what I do every single time I make a visualization, I'm not, I'm not being facetious. I'm being very literal because there's nothing more miserable than working in like a full blown, like any type of app development environment and then needing to go like, if you've worked with any data pre-processing, there's so many little ch -ch -ch changes that you need to make and if you have to build and rebuild every single time you need to make one of those changes, it takes forever. Um, and so would you look at that? We got a visualization going that tells us with the number of issues that are open and then how many of them have a response within those two days. So we've got all of the bones that we need to go and make this, um, to be able to go and make our um, to make eight not work. I don't know why this wants to save something. I don't want it to be saved. Oh well. I'm just gonna do this. But then I can delete it. No. Never mind. Um, so sweet. We'll go over here and now I'm gonna go directly to the visualization template and start just going line by line down what we need to do. And first thing that I notice, and it's kind of in there, I'm just gonna hop over, is that we need to import that query, but we made a new query. So we have to go and also add the query to our, um, to the, to 8 not. So I just go and copy the query template, and we're gonna paste it in here. And that's the copy, and so, Right here, I'm just gonna rename it to issue response query. And so that first to do is replace all instances of name query. And so I'm gonna do and change this to issue response. Issue response, issue response, cool. I went through step one. I wanna paste my SQL query into this string, the query string. So I'm gonna go over here and I've got my SQL ready to go. And then we go in here and it kind of says this as well is that this is how our caching system knows which repositories and so you just replace um, and instead of like a repo statement, we're just gonna, we just put it right here. So instead of repo statement, like you would use in a notebook, it's just we'll percent %s. So we've done that step. Now we wanna go over to the index callbacks and we need to import the query. So 
I'm going to go here. I'm going to go import queries dot issue response query, import issues response query as. So I do it there. I have imported it and then I'm adding it to the list of queries that are going to be run on the build of the application. So we've done that. Now let's go to our next step. So we have done it, we've registered it, it and now we need to go and create a table and DB in it. And so let's go over there. Where is it? There it is. And so now we want to add a table that is specific for this query. And would you look at that? The one that's right above is the one for PR response. So we're familiar that the structure is very similar. So I'm just going to go copy and paste it and take over and make this into an issue first response. Um, instead of um, pull request ID, I'm going to do issue ID. I'm going to change this to a text. We can explain why later, but I have. I just know it's going to make it fail because it, the int is very large, um, and I have learned I learned that the hard way over the weekend. <laughs> Big int, because I've been using it with tech. I just know this works, so we'll go. Um, and so now we've added this into this is all to make sure that all of our data is being um, stored. We have all this is all the columns for that query. We are again just going back to. Over here, we have the, we've registered it now to dbint. We're gonna update the doc string. Um, I'm not actually gonna update it right now because I wanna go quicker. Um, but, and then I would never push this without updating the doc strings because documentation. But for the sake of this workshop, we're gonna hop right along. So now we have our query ready to go. Now let's build a visualization. So we're just gonna go and I'm gonna copy this template and I'm gonna do the exact same thing that I just did in for the queries. And so I would know I wanna add it to the contributions page. So I'm going to paste the um, query template. I actually didn't put it in the right spot. I need to put it in the visualizations um, folder. Um, here is the query, the visualization template and I wanna rename this um, issue first response and now we just go line by line of like variables to change. First one, page. So we're just going to go down and change it to the page of here. So it's contributions. Second one is viz ID and so it's just a short name for the visualization. So I'm just going to choose to um, issue first response. Um, the GC visualization, which is pretty much, this is a group card, you can change this to any, anything, but it's just a, again, just a unique identifier for the visualization card. Um, a lot of this structure just makes it to where you can easily reuse code, um, which we'll kind of see how that all comes together, which is the reason why we're able to take a lot of the code from the other visualizations. Um, we wanna update that title. Um, title is issue first response. Um, I'm gonna do the context of the graph later. Wink, wink. Um, that's just uh, the popover. And so now I wanna go over and do the IDs of the dash components, which the if you haven't like done some familiarity with Dash or Plotly. If you're wanting to get really in the weeds, there's a lot, of, you can talk to me, there's a lot, couple of different like like there's a couple different videos I'd recommend watching just to understand the callback structure, which is why it's so interactive. Um, but for the case of our visualization, I know that PR first response, the structure is exactly what we want whenever it comes to the callbacks, because I know that the only input that we want for this visualization is that response number of days. So I can go to the form of the PR first response, and this has all of the structure, it has the about, and everything that we would need to go directly into making the issues first response. Um, so if we go over to issues, instead of the template has a lot of options already in there that you can do date interval, that's one that's common. There's a lot of stuff that's commented out for you to use 
um, to make your user inputs for your visualization. Um, so I'm just gonna take all of this and take it out. And I just wanna remember exactly where I copied from. So the row, not for me, I'm just gonna do from the form. Yay, brackets. Okay, I'm just gonna copy and paste this all over. So now we know that by putting this directly into the form, this is gonna make it to where our visualization has the exact same inputs as this one, which is the response number of days and the about graph. So we're good to go. And the IDs are already all handled and unique because we use that page and viz ID option. And so even though we used it, we took this from a different page and viz ID, we can do it here because we've defined it uniquely for this page. And so we have our response days that is specifically for issues. And we didn't really need to put any thought into it for the um, visualization. Also for more notes, a lot of the different stuff that I'm talking about that's not on here, this is just like a specific, like you need to remember to change these things, but there's an entire document of every single thing you need to do if you're creating a visualization straight from scratch and I'm not here just monotonally talking about it. <laughs> um, so now we can go and we need to change the name of the visualization graph. Um, so same thing right here. We're gonna go and do issues first response, and I got a little bit distracted, um, of with the IDs, the new, the dash IDs, we now know that it's the response days, and those are gonna go directly into a callback. Um, and so, again, these are some of the things that if you want to start making your own visualizations more specifically, that it'd be good to spend the 30 minutes kind of going through the dash structure, but you're able to follow it just with some of the, in, the inputs to know that we're doing the callback for our visualization. These are commented out because we don't, this is stuff that we don't need. Um, and this one was like the pre-baked option, but that's not what we have. We know that because of the structure up here that we're just gonna take the ID up above and do the, right here. here and then I'm actually going to comment out this bot switch. Um, we in 8 not, and you could make this without it but I know that this is going to make it to where any response from a bot is not automatically considered um, by now we can look at this definition. We have our repo list. We want to have the num days here and then the bot filter. And so we have, when we comment out here, we can see uncomment if, this, if the bot filter applies. And in this case, it does. So we can go and do this. And so actually, it's called bot switch. The bot switch is on. So we have that. We have this set up. Um, let's go back to up to our list. The comments with the date times and the, sorts, the sort by. Um, I'll come back to all of this and then well, let's just hop over to doing the queries. A lot of times whenever I'm going through this, I don't necessarily, you don't have to do it in order. I just delete every time I actually do the thing that it says to me to do. So we need to go and import the queries. So we know our query name is issue response query. The, and we wanna import issue response query as issue response query, cool. And so we'll go down here and we wanna change this. This is pretty much going to our caching system and tells us please get us, us the query for the specific um, repositories that have been requested. And so now we have it set up to where it's going to get the data. We're gonna make sure that, that this is just a preventative like error handling and now let's do that process data stuff that we had already done in our notebook and we have the num days because that's the input in for the days. So for our process data, you can kind of read through all of this whenever we're not walking through, but it kind of tells you how to go and look at if any other visualizations have a similar process. We know that it does, oh no. 
please reopen. Oh. Please. I will be sad. That was really tragic. Let's see. Yes, I was doing, I was on a really good, um, good track. I would have loved to have been slower um, through this, but, um, oh, come on. I'm just gonna reopen my notebook environment really quickly. Actually, you know what, I'm not, this is um, OpenShift AI, um, internal team. This is, remember I was saying that I, I, I put myself in a playpen? This is, I, I, let, I make other people um, <laughs> build the playpen. Um, this is just the notebook that we were looking at before. Um, and so I'm just gonna go and copy and paste what we got from the process data. And we're gonna put that shocker right in process data. And we know we need to do the num response, the get, let's see what, it's mad because I didn't tab. Yeah. That. Want num days. And so we need to get that get open response thing we were looking at earlier. Come on. So I'm just gonna paste this over here, put it in. And so now we have all the data pre-processing and now I wanna go and create the figure, which imports that num days as well. Look at here. Um, <laughs> um, and we're gonna go and take the, <laughs> the um, create figure data and put it directly in the create figure section. And actually, that's from, I'm gonna have to re-edit this because this is not the notebook that we just did. Let me just generalize this back down to data frame. Big shocker, whenever, when I started going into all the deep visualization code, people started leaving quick. <laughs> um, so yeah, we just took pretty much what I was just doing pretty quick. The movie magic is just copying and pasting from that notebook. Um, and so now I know all the queries are, are done, so I can delete that. I know that we'll do comments and things hypothetically later. Um, but we know the sort by, the date time, all of that has been handled by the stuff that we did in the notebook. Um, and so now we just need to go through and, and to, we just need to import the visualization into the page, which this is all directly in that note, from dot visualizations dot issue first response, import GC issues first response, and then we'll just make a new column this is just the putting that visualization on the page like we were showing. Um, issue response. You see issue first response. Let's say that. And then that's all done. Cool. We've done everything that we need to do based off of the template. Obviously, we'd want to clean everything up, but let's see if on the first run it works. That would be surprising. <laughs> so, just built it the same way that we would before. Um, I don't want to, <laughs> we don't have time to. It'll work without the I've already run it with. And would you look at that? Issue first response is there. And let's see, okay. 
Boo. Um, no, it's actually not. It's from the, I know this is from, it's from the, I've done this every single time I've demoed it, is that we, the, the results is in DF responses, and so I just need to make sure that that's the um, thing that we get from our process data function, and let's try this one more time. Oh yeah, so that's just the pipin thing that I would, like. So pretty much, if you have, uh, um, the it's not a file, uh, or I guess it's a file. But I don't like uh, pretty much all I do if I'm in an environment is that I make sure that pipin is installed, and then if you're you cd into that repository, you just have to you just have to run pipin install, and it installs all of the um, requirements that are um, set for that repository. Oh, the requirements is like in a requirement txt, I would assume. Yeah, because that was a that was a point that we were kind of like I didn't really know with the notebook side of things of how much we wanted to set up an environment and all the different stuff. But would you look at that? We got a little working visualization. Everything's good. We can see, obviously, whenever you go and plug something back in, there's going to be little things that you're going to want to tweak on. Um, but we have a functioning vi um, first response visualization. Um, I would, I know we went through that pretty fast. Um, good things to note whenever we try to do this again of trying to figure out how to simplify some stuff. Um, but that is like an end-to-end -end process of making a visualization from concept to looking at the documents that are available, looking at the code of things that are already existing in 8-Not, getting it working in a notebook, and then getting that based off of the templates working interactively in a dashboard environment. So that's that. People have questions, comments. I just talked a lot for a long time. So, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, please, like, tell us, like, reach out to us. Let us know. Open issues. Um, like, y'all are honestly, like, such a good um, litmus test for us. Because you, you should be able to do this with our doc, if, if you're not able to follow the documentation to create a new visualization, that means that there's stuff that we need to add. So um, that means mutually um, productive stuff. So yeah. yeah any questions? Questions, comments? Yeah, I know we just, there's a lot of information, there was a lot of information for three hours. I know, I, and that's, we're going to be doing a similar, t a similar workshop at another event. And so if there's any things that you'd be like, maybe next time don't spend as much time there. This is the stuff that needs more time. Great feedback. Always welcome. So, yeah. yeah that's all we got. Thanks for everyone staying to to till the end. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, it's Open Source Summit North America. It's the it's one of the events run by the Linux Foundation. Yeah.